Tartarian, China, China in Tartary. Here I'm reading an interesting article by a Chinese professor, or somebody writing about the Chinese professor. There's so much I want to talk about right now, my brain is about to explode. There's no way I could talk about all the different topics, I know. I want to talk about this Chinese Tartary and this Chinese professor at a respected university in China and his thoughts on the old world. But I think I'll open up with the giants of old. Not only were people giants, Adam and Eve, all the old characters at our supposed beginning of time, but they lived long, 800 years, a thousand years, and then there was a cataclysm. Now, I often reference the Bible, but one of my favorites are the Sumerian texts, which predate the Bible and have a very similar story. Frankly, I think it's ignorant not to look at that story. If you were a scholar or student of the Bible, it should interest you to the similar stories from different parts of the world that share the same story. And in the Sumerian case, we get even more detail. We have the Anunnaki, another people, another breed, and they are much greater than man. And in fact, they created man originally as a slave race to mine gold. There was a race before man that they created, the Agigi, and they grew uncontrollable and were discontinued and discarded. And then they create man in their image using part of their DNA and part of the Agigi, or prior races, formula, making them a little weaker, removing or even fusing parts of the DNA, giving us shorter lives and a smaller stature. And in the Anunnaki stories, they are well aware of the resets and the cyclical cycle that returns and wipes out this realm for a moment. And the Sumerian tablets are dealing with a family, with the father being Anu, and Enlil and Enki, the good and the bad brother. And it depends. One is led more by principles, and one seems to have a heart. Enki. And Enki is the scientist responsible for our creation in this story. Eventually the cataclysm comes, and the debate is whether to let the people be wiped out completely. And Enki disobeys the decision to let the people be wiped out, and he saves a portion of mankind. And this is where we would get the whispering to Noah. This could be a metaphor. But here we get the continuation of the story in the Bible. And we start all over. And ultimately, this is where our knowledge and wisdom for all the great wonders we see throughout come from. We were instructed. We didn't simply evolve from ape and build the glorious civilizations, move from hunter to farmer to builder. We had help, and all cultures Talk about this help after a great flood, helping to jumpstart civilization again. And are we upon another reset? I remember in 2012 or 2013, when the sun went from yellow to white, I told everybody I knew, and as usual, everyone thought I was crazy. But I thought they were crazy for not noticing it. I mean, happening overnight, I walked outside and the sky was white, and I thought either something changed or my eyesight was bad. But I didn't think it was my eyesight, and still don't. And I've been watching videos from people all over the world recently, and it seems like everybody is sharing my great wind, violent winds. The kind that makes me question whether I put enough screws in my house. And I have no doubt the wind and the sun are completely connected. I can feel the outbursts from the sun, and then I confirm this with both amateur and expert trackers of the sun, and it seems that when it flares, the wind blows. The wind is not something spinning around a ball, but rather an electromagnetic disturbance coming from the luminary. And I think the luminary itself gets its power from the black sun, 
black sun is shooting the aurora borealis or northern lights display from our perspective and now let's look at the work of this chinese professor thanks for being here i hope you're all well and welcome So Chinese Tartary. I'm such a mess. I had all these other things I've been wanting to share for weeks. Some new topics and some further research into others, such as the ruins in Colorado that were paved over by the Department of Transportation. But I guess this is it. This is what I opened up this morning. A Chinese professor claims that the Egyptian pyramids, the Parthenon, and other remnants of ancient civilizations in the West were all faked by Western scholars in order to fabricate an ancient history and diminish the glory of China. This was reported by Hong Kong News, and they claim these are false claims by the professor Huang Heking. While ultra-nationalist conspiracy theories are not rare in China, or in any other country, what makes this story even more bizarre is that Huang teaches in the School of Arts and Archaeology at Zijiang University, one of the oldest, most selective and prestigious universities in China. Huang stated in his lecture, that from the 19th to 20th centuries, the West was rampantly forging historical and cultural relics and spending huge sums of money everywhere, from the Mediterranean to India, fabricating fake ancient artifacts. The Pyramid of Khufu and the Great Sphinx of Giza were made of concrete and constructed in the 19th century, Huang claims. A well-known French chemist and scientist conducted physical and chemical analysis of the pyramids in the 80s and confirmed that it mostly consisted of concrete. And we've discussed this before. I think the documentary was called K something, K2 or 1. In addition, the stones at the bottom of the pyramid have a lip shape, which are signs that they were cast. The ancient Egypt we know today is actually a fairy tale fabricated by Western Orthodox historians since the 19th century. He says Western scholars elevated the status of ancient Egypt, Mesopotamian, and Indian civilizations at China's expense. And to some extent, I can already agree. Not 100%, but I think he's on the same trail that we are, but coming from a Chinese perspective. Very bold and risky of him, considering the political state of his country. He says the intention of this conspiracy, fictionalizing these three civilizations to appear to be older than Chinese civilization, was to weaken the glory of Chinese civilization. Chinese civilization is more ancient, Huang said. The now 63-year-old doctoral supervisor obtained his first degree majoring in French, studied Western art history, and eventually got a PhD. He's been a professor at the Zijiang University since 2000. Professor Huang's theory is truly innovative, and he claims he can prove his theory with pictures. And here he claims this is an old picture or depiction of the pyramids in 1809. I don't know how we could prove that. He says the purpose is of depreciating Chinese culture. That's why they made these forgeries. The West is always making up history and falsifying ancient relics. Hong wrote in the fictitious history of Western civilization, published in 2017, that primitive Europe was brought into civilization of the world by China from which it obtained writing, navigation, technology, economy, bureaucracy, democracy, philosophy, and history. The history of ancient Greece is a cultural movement. This movement began around the 14th century, rather than a renaissance of classical Western civilization. The Age of Enlightenment was a product of contact with Chinese civilization. 
So super interesting. I could go into more detail, but I'd rather just share my thoughts now. I think in part he's right. However, what he's failing to mention is what we found in our research. And predating China on old maps is Tartaria. And I don't know if he's failing to mention this or somehow in his scholarliness has missed it. And I think to some extent part of his theory is absolutely right. That what we call the Greco-Roman style may not have originated from Greece or Rome. And what we see, and what I have shown in at least dozens of videos by now, is this supposed Greco-Roman style is found all over China. And pyramids are found in China, the supposed Greco-Roman architecture is found in China, and really it's found all over the world, every country. And who can say exactly where the origination of this comes from. And he proposes that it came from the southwest of China. And pre-reset, who knows who was living in China? I've stated in the past that I think Chinese civilization, or the wisdom, the sciences, the medical understanding, beyond, I think, what we have today, still, came from a past and great civilization. However, I think the Chinese people are inheritors, and inheritors do utilize what they've inherited, if they're smart, and they have. And even in old Chinese history, we're told that the Yellow Emperor just arrived and brought everything. Boom. No progression. Just brought all these sciences of civilization to the people overnight. And this to me is a clear story of an inheritance explaining it away. One of my favorites are the images of the Winter Palace in ruins depicting this Greco-Roman style columns and and to finally tie this back to our origins, what we see is the Chinese government hiding the fact that red-haired, light-skinned mummies, well-dressed, are found all over China. And at one point were on tour, and the Chinese government stopped the tour because it was raising concerns about who really inhabited China before the Chinese people. So I think that's it. I'm going to leave it there, cut it a little short in hopes that I can jump in for a bonus and just share some of the other things that I wasn't able to get to. Some of my favorite things that you all share with me are just the random little places nearby where you live or where you'd been as a youth. Random little places that I would never ever come across. It's weird enough to see the Capitol buildings courthouses, post offices, cathedrals, universities, and other major architectural wonders. Even these don't work in the narrative. Everything way too over the top and unnecessary for a people in the mid to late 1800s. And when dealing with any dates before that period, just even more ridiculous. But again, it's the random little places that are some of my favorites. We could look at something over the top like the World's Fair in San Francisco, for example. And it's all so much, and there's so much to examine. So many buildings, hundreds. But right down the street, we have the Sutro Baths, less known to a non-local of the Bay Area. And the Sutra Baths being some kind of resort bathhouse, which really looks like some type of cooling pond for a power plant. And it was supposedly destroyed by fire, bringing down stone, brick, glass, and iron, as usual. Magical fire. But here today, and for the last couple of weeks, I've wanted to share a little castle with you that was shared with me. It's called the French Lick Resort. What a weird name. And here's a little picture of her. Now has a little pizza place down here. I wonder how their pizza is. And I was told in a comment that French Lick was 
Home of the NBA star Larry Bird. I'm not sure anymore. But this is a casino. A resort in the Midwest US. Located in the towns of West Baden Springs and French Lick, Indiana. The 3,000 acre complex includes two historic resort spa hotels, stables, a casino, and three golf courses. Ding! You know how I feel about golf courses. The casino opened for business in 2006. And let's have a little peek at Indianapolis. Here we can see their courthouse. And again, the top and the cupola. Here we can see one of their monuments, one of my favorite monuments. Soldier and sailors, I believe, or something like that. A cathedral, and just a bunch of historic sites. So here we go. Now we're getting into history. While they want to tell us this was opened in 2006, the site was originally known as the French Lick Springs Hotel, a grand resort that was a mineral spring health spa. And again now, tying back to the sutra baths and all these bathhouses of the old world. Wouldn't it be nice if we had so many healing bathhouses today? So it was first built around 1845. They enlarged it, but it burned in 1897, of course. Rebuilt and expanded, looks the same, on an even grander scale. In the 1920s, the resort became known for its recreational sports, mostly golf, of course, as they tore down many of these structures on this 3,000 acre property. Probably resembled a World's Fair. The hotel was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2003. Always so late. And the restored hotel reopened in 2006. I guarantee it's the original one. I'll show you some pictures of that. The West Baden Springs Hotel was built in 1902. So this is just another building in the complex. Let me show you that. And here we go. And it looks like it's been newly stuccoed and painted, but I hope to show you some black and white pics from the early 1900s where it looked exactly the same. I was on a different website the other day, an article, rather. So this dome here, 200 foot dome covering an atrium, prior to the completion of the Coliseum in Charlotte, North Carolina, had the largest free-spanning dome in the United States up until 1955. So this old wonder, and you see my point, is this random obscure place that nobody's ever heard of was host to the largest dome in the world. Whenever we read these histories, everything is always the largest in the world. It was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1974, and it became a historic landmark in 1987. And here they throw in some what seems like made-up stories of the Native Americans using this area for hunting. And maybe the Native Americans were occupying it. All right, let me get right to it. 1909, West Baden Springs Hotel. Ah, oh, they don't want to show it to us. Somebody has cartoonified it to hide its glory. Look at that. That is not the same picture. Let me see if I can zoom into this. You see, it looks better in the small picture. This is pretty shady. Not surprising. The new hotel opened in 1902, West Baden Springs. What kind of hotel in 1902? And here we can see the hotel natatorium We've looked at natatoriums in almost every state now. Most recently in Montana. Beautiful. Hot Springs Resorts. Really resembling Roman bathhouses. And I don't think that this was the purpose of these structures. Not at all. Not with the sutro baths. Not with any of them. Here someone has just put random seating along the rail. Doesn't seem... Like this is what it was intended for, similar to a cathedral and just sticking a bunch of crappy pews 
down the center of it doesn't seem like part of the original function. And here we go, West Baden Springs Hotel Atrium. And mind you, this place was closed for a long time. As we can see up here, it was just reopened in 2006 to the public. And yet, going way back, this thing has just been sitting in private hands for some time, deciding what they would do with it. And now they've just opened it up. 2006, now we can go stay here. And look at this, look at this tech with this ball coming down from the dome. I mean, this is clearly tech. This is overkill for the early 1900s. World's largest dome, like a stadium. But we're told it was a 1900s hotel. And one may think this is new, because it's been painted and upgraded and made to look very Las Vegas-y. And let me show you some pictures of this in black and white. Here's an old, old sketch. But I'm looking for one in particular that was black and white and showed the controllers with the hands in the pocket. And forgive me, I don't think I can find that right now. I'm not sure where I saw it. And here's an old picture I hadn't seen. Here looking more original. Here some kind of advertisement. And that's the nature of research. You should share it immediately when it's fresh on your mind. So anyway, I think there's a lot more to explore here. I would love to stay in this hotel and snoop around for the night. But I think I'll leave it there. I'm running out of time. But I'm glad I got to it. At least got to share it with you all. Or scratch the surface. Of the French Lick Resort in Indiana. Here I thought we'd go bonus for a moment. This film was shared by Captain Kirk Channel, and it's of Coney Island in the early 1900s. Now, this seemed like a movie. These two ridiculous characters running around like children, but the camera was not focusing on the architecture, but rather these two people. And here they're boarding on a camel, and I noticed in the captain's comments, somebody said, did you notice the person at, I think it was Mark 420. So I jumped on and looked at it again at Mark 420. And what the commenter was saying was, did anybody notice the guy in the baggy pants and the short sleeve t-shirt walk by and look at the camera? And here he is. There he is in the background, and it almost looks like he's wearing a t-shirt and maybe a white long sleeve underneath it. I can't really tell. Let's zoom in a little bit and watch him again. I don't know what's up with that arm. It's pretty stiff, as if he has a clenched fist or something. Here I've lightened up the image a little bit. And we can actually get a pretty good look at him right here. Really having a pointy seeming nose. Maybe not. I don't know. Looking like Lady Lane in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And even kind of a conquistador. Maybe wearing some kind of chest plate over his t-shirt. I don't know. But the person was absolutely right. He's completely out of place. Does he have something around his neck, like a camera? It's kind of blurred. And maybe it was blurred out. And I don't know about his shirt. Or if he has like a towel around his neck. Definitely baggy pants. And looking almost leather. Look how shiny. Look at that shine. Some black, baggy, pretty sweet pants. He almost looks like Quentin Tarantino. And even he likes to insert himself into his films. So I don't know. Let me know what you think. Check out Captain Kirk's video on Coney Island. And is this a time traveler? As always, I don't know. But I love you all. Thanks for joining me. Do have a blessed day. And I'll see you next week.